really glad that you're all here with us tonight. Um, and uh, this is a, a, a podcast of Paths to Understanding, which is formerly Neighbors in Faith and, pa and, and the Tracy Levine Center. Our mission is to bridge bias and build unity through multi-faith peacemaking. Um, tonight from Chicago, we're happy to have Shanta Pramawardhana, uh, the Reverend Doctor, actually, who's the president of Omnia Institute for Contextual Leadership a global training organization that builds interfaith peacemaker teams to counter religious extremism and religious-based oppression, domination, and violence. It trains people of faith to deconstruct theologies of exclusivism and superiority and reconstruct theologies of pluralism. Shanta was previously the director for interreligious dialogue and cooperation at the World Council of Churches. And, uh, and prior to moving to Geneva to do that role, he was the Associate General Secretary for Interfaith Relations at the National Council of Churches of Christ. Uh, Shanta earned his PhD in religion at Northwestern University in Evanston, Illinois. I played a lot of good basketball in Evanston, by the way, it was very fun. And he's the, an Emeritus Trustee of the Parliament of the World's Religions and currently serves on the Board of Governors of the National Council of Churches USA. So we're so happy to have you with us, Shanta. It's a blessing to be with you. Thank you very much. I really appreciate the opportunity. And so, I look forward to this. so Shanta, um, you know, right now uh, we have COVID-19 taking place in our country. You know, we have uh, with over 100,000 deaths now and probably many more given the fact that, uh, that people with other conditions uh, appear to be dying at a much higher rate than, than before COVID-19. And we have that going on. We also have uh, the, the terrible, tragic, unjust death of George Floyd and, um, and the understandable um, rage that people of color and people who care about, about our nation and about people of color are feeling right now uh, with the protests these last, this last week. Um, how are things in Chicago? And, and, uh, and do you have any reaction to all that's going on or any analysis you might want to share with us? Well, thank you. Yes, indeed. That's the most important thing that's in our lives right now. Uh, Chicago uh, has had uh, its share of protests uh, and its share of vandalism and lootings. But as you know, uh, television screens, cameras tend to go directly to those. So it appears as if there's more looting and vandalism than there actually is. Uh, there are large numbers of nonviolent protesters. I prefer to call them that. Um, and, uh, and, and, and wanted to get a message across that they will not tolerate, that we, we will not tolerate this kind of behavior, police brutality again in this country. In some sense, I believe that um, uh, the people who have authority over us, we've given authority by our consent. But the protests, they have, they have squandered that authority. And therefore, the protests are our way of saying, we are withdrawing that consent from you. That's what's happening. I don't, I think that everybody is thinking that we are not going to go back to where we were before. We are not going to tolerate another George Floyd situation in this country. Um, so I think this is a defining moment for us. And I am pleased to say that there are many religious leaders who are in clerical garb, uh, who are multi-faith people, uh, Christians, Jews, Muslims, Buddhists, they are all out there uh, to, uh, to support the protest movement because we are clear that we cannot tolerate police brutality anymore. It, it really seems to me that that uh, religious leaders have a, a very powerful role to play here. I'm um, speaking and I, and I think it's it's even more powerful when we're willing to speak as you say in a multi-faith or interfaith way uh, because um, because we can we can speak to to common human values to common values of different wisdom traditions. We can speak even to common American values. Um, and, I, and I think what's also been really Im important uh, from what I've been able to see and experience myself is to see people in, in clerical garb and, and, and who, are, who are religious leaders in some way or another actually supporting the voices 
of young, uh, young people of color, young, young black leaders out there on the streets and taking their lead from them. And it's just, it's so important that we speak with that kind of voice right now in the middle of this, uh, because when we're able to speak together, we kind of, I think, disarm some of this us versus them sort of uh, um, assumption that, that many of us are bringing to this conversation. Indeed, and I think that is very important. The, the, even my argument is that even our theological work, our religious work, must begin with the conversations, with the, with the questions and the struggles of the people who are in our neighborhoods. It's not something that comes from the top down, but it comes from the bottom up. So it is very heartening to see and hear religious leaders engaging with the people on the streets right now and being able to, um, uh, to, to listen to the questions and the struggles that they are bringing, their passion and their anger, all of that mixed up. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a big mix of things that they're bringing. And, and it's our role as religious leaders to try to sort that out and to be able to speak um, not only a, not just a healing word, I think, but but a but a word of truth that sometimes accentuates the anger, but ultimately is the real path to healing. Yeah, I think within the both the Jewish and the Christian tradition, at least, um, and in others, uh, there's this idea that when you speak peace, when there is no peace, that that you're you're essentially acting as a false prophet in that moment. Correct. And because, because the, the pain of this moment can instruct us if we can embrace it and be uncomfortable enough to look at ourselves as a country and even ourselves as persons or as religious organizations, to have, to have the faith to look at the discomfort of this moment and embrace it and learn from it. Indeed. I think that's absolutely right. So I think religious leaders have a very important role to play in that. I'm going to say the next thing that you're going to ask me. Yeah, now, go, go for it. <laughs> it is interesting to see the juxtaposition of President Trump yes. in, the, in, in that situation. Yes. See, what happened yesterday at, the, um, at, at St. John's Church, by the yes, way, yes. I, I used to know the previous rector of that church, but the, the, uh, what happened there was, was really the other side of it. You, you know, it is that he, he clears the road with, with, uh, with the military, you know, with the armed forces throwing tear gas on nonviolent protesters and clearing the road for him to come out. Yes. Just having spoken about how he's going to declare war on the United States, on Americans, on our own citizens. And then he comes and holds up a Bible in front of the church and to, I'm looking at them saying, what a, not, not just what a sickening spectacle on the one hand, but on the other hand, this is what Christians have done throughout centuries. Christian people, Christ, Christian politicians, Christian leaders, Christian kings have used religion, have used the Bible, have used the church in order to, to drive towards war and violence and to kill people throughout history. And that's, that's the problem that we have. Fortunately, this time, and I applaud the bishops, I applaud the Bishop of Washington, I, I just listened to, uh, to the presiding Bishop Michael Curry, yes. in no uncertain terms, condemning that action as outrageous. So, there was a time, though, yeah. when the bishops didn't do that. There was a time when the bishops were right beside him, like how some of the evangelical or right-wing leaders are praising President Trump for doing that today. Well, so, and, 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 and this history goes back a long, a long ways, Shanta, and, and I, I certainly look back uh, to the Emperor Constantine essentially appropriating the church and even appropriating the, the symbol of the cross. Indeed. saying that he had a dream that, that he saw a cross in the sky and and he said in this by this symbol you'll 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 get you'll achieve victory and then began to to capture soldiers and capture generals and and baptize them 
before beheading them. And, and, and then, of course, uh, about 500 years ago now, uh, we, have, um, we have European kings and, and queens uh, deciding to create a policy of, of, of domination and dehumanization toward people who are black and brown, toward, toward people in lands that were, where, where they weren't, uh, they weren't uh, Christian. And we saw that, that, sev that the several popes uh, created uh, the, the doctrine of, of discovery, but really is a doctrine of dehumanization of people who are black and brown and, and that th it's okay, and even giving divine sanction to, uh, to kill them, to enslave them, to take their land and, and, and property, to destroy their way of life. Mm. And that kind of divine sanction, of course, is extremely ancient. Uh, Pharaoh used you know, divine sanctions, saying that he was the son of the god Ray. The Babylonian kings did this. Augustus Caesar himself claimed to be the son of the god Apollo. Mm. And so what Trump is going for when he, when he does this rather, rather crass and obvious move is he's trying to claim divine sanction for dominating people of color. Exactly. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, that's, uh, th the story of the doctrine of discovery is something that many people don't know, at least don't know enough about. Yes. This was uh, 1452. Um, and, uh, and, and doctrine of discovery is when the church officially sanctioned um, domination of other people. And this is when a 500 year history of colonialism began. Yes. And, uh, uh, you know, the atrocities of that uh, period uh, is uh, very well documented. I don't need to go into that. But it's a terrible period uh, of, 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 of dominating African, Latin American, and Asian peoples, particularly, and the Native Americans of the United States, of, yes. of America, of Canada, of uh, of North America. So, uh, so that's a sordid history of violence sanctioned by the church that, um, that, that is there. So one, what is different though, when we talk about how religious leaders today in, in, on the streets of the protests are relating with, learning from, uh, listening to people who are marching uh, people who are who who are angry, people who are who who have questions and struggles around this question of police brutality, and their theologizing comes from below. That's a huge difference from the way that from the way that those bishops and those popes acted in those days. So I hope that this is a thing of the past, but. You know, when you have a Trump holding up a Bible, you kind of skip, your heart skips a beat and say, maybe we are not there yet. With this whole business of the protests, we are wondering, we are not there yet. And, and what does it take for us to get there? That's our big question. Yeah, I think, and I think, you know, part of it, Shanta, and this is such a complex topic and, and you know, we could, we would, we would have to, I would have to be a lot smarter than I am to really tease it all out. But I, I, I've read a book by William T. Kavanaugh called The Myth of Religious Violence. And, and part of what he says in that is, that is that quite often the role of religion is overblown in terms of some of our narratives about how, how European colonial powers, you know, used their, their institutional, you know, imperial power. And sometimes uh, the, the European powers used religion in some ways as a scapegoat as well as trying to claim divine sanction for their activities. And, and it's an immensely complex thing because I, I do think there are times in Western society when we sort of minimalize, uh, we, we minimize the, the contributions of, of religious traditions or we reduce it as John Locke did to simply uh, an individual belief or we blame religion for all of our problems. So once I was on the street and, and uh, in a protest, and this, this man said to me, uh, he walked up to me, saw my collar, and he said, you know, your God is killed, has been the source of all wars. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, well, brother, I, I have a little difference. I think it's a different G word that's the so source of most wars. And he said, yeah, what's that? I said, it's greed. Yes. <laughs> I said that the sin of the church 
is adding divine sanction to that mm. because the church got some contributions from be, from being too close mm. uh, to the to people in power. I don't know how you respond to that. That's true. That's that's entirely true. So um, I, I think the, I think the question is complex. Religion has been used by by political power, but religious leaders have often allowed themselves to be used because Absolutely. they got something out of it. I've, I've often f said and known in my heart that religious leaders are also political leaders mm -hmm. because they have a constituency yeah. that they must uh, answer to, um, but they don't admit to being political leaders. That's the problem. <laughs> so, 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 so they they have to they they not only do they have to please them, but they have to please the powers who will who will provide them with some favors. If if any of us think through carefully and reflect on it carefully, any of us who are religious leaders, we will recognize our own culpability in that. It's very hard for us. We are all compromised in, in that sense yes. because we live in a capitalistic society where greed is the thing that drives pretty much everything. So how does the church extricate themselves from that? Apart from, as one of my mentors, Aloysius Peer, is a, a, a Sri Lankan uh, Jesuit, said apart from embracing voluntary poverty. If you embrace voluntary poverty, you can do that. And this is what our, our, our religious leaders, all our religious leaders have done. Um, but, but unless you are a monk like Aloysius Priest, you can't easily do that. <laughs> this is our problem. So we are caught in and we are compromised. Yeah, so, so Shanta, this is going a, a place I didn't expect it to go, but it's a place I'm really happy to, to spend a moment. Um, a, a number of years ago, I, I actually 15 years ago, I began to think about the church and why it is that we have such difficulty speaking truth uh, about the, the, the situation that we're in. And I was thinking even then about, about racism and wealth and income inequality and injustices of many kinds. And I look around and I don't see many pastors, uh, other, other faith leaders speaking about these issues. And in fact, what I witnessed was people in the congregations who cared about them actually being forced to leave the church because they were bothering people, they were disturbing people, uh, much in the way that Jesus or Moses or Muhammad or Buddha or many other leaders have disturbed people. Mm -hmm. And I realized that part of it was, was the very structure of of four sort of religious organizations, where where you, you where, where it, as, as most like Lutheran churches, for instance, have a very expensive business model. You know, we have a pastor, we have an organist, we have a, a, a administrative staff, we have a building, we have a parking lot that takes a lot of money, and so you have to kind of find a, a lowest common denominator with people in the neighborhood or people in that city to be able to get folk to come in. And, 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 and a lot of times, you know, what I find is that, is that folk uh, feel like they're called to speak about an issue, but know that they can only go so far and, and sort of maintain their community, which is not always bad because religious community provides a lot of wonderful things, you know, Indeed. but, but there, there are times when, when, when we, we don't, we're not conscious enough about the way we've been compromised that way and don't take the risk that I think Jesus and other leaders would call us to take? One, one clear answer to that question is to be in constant communication with people in the margins. If you begin to think that your people are the people in your congregation, yes, whatever religion you are, it doesn't matter. If you think that, that the, your people are the people in your congregation, you get into that that vicious cycle. However, if you begin to think that the people in your community, the people in your neighborhood, the people in your village are your people, and therefore what is going on in down the down the block or, or on the other side of the of the community 
is also matters to you. That is your pastoral concern. If there's a drug house in the community, you know, if there is some uh, uh, poor people that are that are in the in the community, if there's something that has to do with uh, 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 school funding, that's a problem in the community. That becomes your pastoral concern. It's not only the people in your congregation, but in fact, I've, I've often said that the way to measure the health of a congregation is not by its grand music or its beautiful liturgy or its fabulous preaching, but from the health of the community that you're located. And so preachers and pastors really ought to recognize that that they are not just pastors to the congregation, they are pastors to the community. That's a very important principle. When you do that, and you recognize the person who is your neighbor, who may not come to church at all, is your pastoral concern, then that becomes the thing that drives your, your theology, your teaching, your preaching, your, how, you, how you conduct your ministry. Yeah, and I think when we when we do it well, um, we we invite members of of the congregation to join us in conversation with members of the community, exactly. and then they become, in many respects, the best advocates for those voices, and that begins to shift the conversation. Right. That becomes to shift the conversation in the congregation. Yeah, it's not just what you're saying. This is what the congregation demands of you. Because they are in touch with the community. Yeah, you know, in, in 2003, my congregation here uh, in, in Anacortes led a conversation about the Iraq War. And it was not a partisan conversation at all. It was one about theology and policy. Uh, and uh, um, I had a gentleman uh, who gave m a lot of money to the church uh, come to me and tell me that I sh we should stop the conversation because he, quote, liked to have the pastor's ear. Yeah. And I told him eventually in the conversation that, that this was not my decision, that we had to talk about it with the church council. And that the pastor's ear, eventually I had to say it was not for sale. Right. But uh, I, we, I, I had to go to a, I, I had to take, go to a half time or three quarter time position at that point. And so I, I think that, that we have to make, uh, we have to be willing to take those risks, I think. Uh, but we, we all must also realize that even when we do, um, we're still compromised in some ways. And that's, and that's a challenge. Um, that, that just really is a challenge. So let, let's just move to the, to the National Council of Churches for a minute and your work there. And a lot of folk might not understand like what the National Council of Churches in the USA does and and so can you just give us a brief glimpse into some of what you were trying to do in your leadership there? Yeah, it's been a while now, uh, Terry, it's, uh, since I've been there. Um, I, I, my, the bio that you read of mine is slightly wrong, and that okay. is that I have now stepped down from being on the Board of Governors of the National Council of Churches. Um, it is, a, uh, it is a, a, com a community of communions. That's how we talk about it. Uh, because there is a dynamism to the uh, relationships that we build there. Uh, that's 39 Christian communions, all the way from Anglicans uh, to, uh, to, uh, uh, to uh, Malankara Syrian Orthodox Church. You know, I mean, there are all variety of churches that are a part of denominations that are a part of the National Council of Churches. Uh, there are obviously national councils of churches all over the world, but uh, U.S. Uh, national council of churches uh, carries some weight uh, because um, because it's larger than uh, than than many others. The others are more regional, if you want to be larger. Just one little interesting uh, interesting uh, piece, and that is that the Bible that President Trump was holding up was a revised standard version. <laughs> that, was, that, was, that was printed 70 years ago, published 70 years ago. There is now a new revised standard version right. print, published uh, more recently. But the copyright is held by a National Council of Churches. Yes. 
So the, the, the more Bibles people buy, the National Council of Churches benefits. I, I think see. all your needers, re, uh, uh, listeners need to know that and go out and buy new Revised Standard Version Bibles. This is good for the work of the, uh, of the churches. So one <laughs> brief thing, uh, uh, it, it, churches together, the, the purpose of the of a National Council uh, is uh, to create unity among the churches. Mm -hmm. uh, as uh, Jesus said in, uh, in Jesus' prayer of John 17, that they may all be one. That's the purpose of the ecumenical gatherings like that and organizations like that. Uh, and together they decide to do a variety of things, including justice and advocacy, including uh, uh, Christian education, uh, including uh, uh, interfaith relations, uh, including questions around climate change, you know, variety of things like that, that the National Council of Churches works on, as long as it can work together with the 39 communions. Uh, it, most of the mainline churches in the United States are somehow affiliated with the National Council of Churches. Well, and, and what, that, what that meant today, honestly, is that after, after the president you know, did that horrific, made that, that, that terrible authoritarian speech, drove the protesters, the peaceful protesters out using violence and held up that Bible, that not only did the local Episcopal bishop speak out against the use of one of her churches uh, as, as a prop, um, not only did, the, did Bishop Curry write an excellent statement about that, but so did uh, many other na national bishops exactly. uh, support them in their in their uh, discomfort uh, with with the use of that church in the way that the president did. So that unity actually helps uh, all of them to speak with a moral voice at a national level, as well as local faith leaders and regional bishops doing the same thing. That is correct. And uh, National Council of Churches now is uh, located in Washington D.C., right uh, a block or two from the from uh, the the United States Congress, which means that it gives it uh, a lot of uh, opportunity to, to engage with uh, the U.S. government. On yeah, it's, it, it's quite wonderful. And then can you just share with us briefly, you know, what the World, what the world uh, Council of Churches is about and, and some of the work you did through interreligious dialogue and cooperation there? Well, World Council of Churches in terms of uh, membership is about 10 times larger. It's got 300 and 50 or so member communions and um, uh, and they are all over the world you you, you can't go to any place in the book well there are a few places in the world that you will go to that there aren't any WCC related churches uh, and they are uh, Protestant and Orthodox um, and Anglican the um, uh, it, it's sort of the corresponding organization to the Vatican Mm -hmm. um, but because Vatican is so large, it doesn't usually participate organically in the World Council of Churches, although there are some many, uh, there are many uh, ways in which we look for relationships to work together with the Vatican. My work there had to do with um, how Christians must engage with people of other religions. So, for example, what is the theological basis? This is still a contested issue. Among, among Christians, because people think that the exclusivism that we have grown up with, it's a part of that received theology that I call it, <coughs> that, that exclusivism precludes us from, from engaging with people who are of different religions. Mm -hmm. And uh, what I needed to do was to offer an alternative way of looking at scripture and about, uh, about tradition to be able to say, no, it is in fact our, uh, the gospel compels us uh, to relate with Jews and Muslims and, and Buddhists and Hindus and Baha'is and all of those because Jesus called us to love our neighbor as ourselves. That's the most primary commandment of Jesus. Love God and love your neighbor as yourself. A and there are varieties of other scriptures that you use, you can use to do that. The other, of course, is to build the relationships themselves with religious leaders from around the world. So I had the good fortune, good opportunity uh, to meet with uh, Jewish, Muslim, 
um, uh, Hindu, Buddhist, and other religious leaders on behalf of the churches and to build those relationships on behalf of the churches as well. And then that, that, those relationships then begin to model and kind of help people, help provide in some ways uh, political cover or, or, and also just flat out leadership and methodologies for how people at more local levels can learn to, to respect each other and be in relationship themselves. Uh, you know, I think, uh, so there, there is something about human beings, you know, Shanta, thinking about this, you know, how, how difficult we have sometimes relating to people who we perceive to be part of a different group. You know, and, and I think this is a, a, a theological question for the ages, you know, um, you know, why, why do we have such difficulty? Uh, why are we so vulnerable, maybe a way to put it, uh, to dis, dis trusting or fearing um, or treating badly those who are part of a different group? What, what do you think about that in all your experience in working in this field? The, the, um, this is a very difficult question uh, about identity. Um, identity uh, is important to us, but we have um, grown up because of all the varieties of anxieties that people have uh, to, to, to create uh, inflexible group identities. So, for example, I am originally from Sri Lanka, so I'm a Sri Lankan Christian. That doesn't change. The thing is, I've lived in the United States for 40 years. <laughs> so I'm an American too, right? So, but, but, but it, it, it's also different because I, I, I grew up as a Baptist. That's my identity is a Baptist. But I am very quickly, because of the context I grew up in, I'm very ecumenical. Uh, and not only ecumenical, interreligious, because... All of my, you know, I grew up in a very Buddhist environment and, and my, my self-understanding includes a great deal of Buddhist uh, self-understanding as well. So in many ways, I am much more than simply saying I'm that exclusivistic Baptist, but I'm much broader than that. My, it, my, uh, my I suppose it's my ethnic identity is, is broader than what it used to be, my religious identity. So, so that identity has for me become more porous, mm. more flexible. It, it's more bending. Right. This is true for many people today. The young people who are marching on the streets today are white and black and Latino and Asian and Native American and everything. It's not just, we are, nobody is saying, you know, this is a black issue, an African American issue. We are going Absolutely. to say, no, everybody's out there, right? Because there's a, there's a sense in which we have become so socialized in such a way that we don't think of ourselves in, in, in those isolated cocoons that we used to, uh, particularly in monocultural environments where, you know, people in a previous generation perhaps grew up in. Uh, but today we are in a very different environment. In, across the world, this is the case. And so I think we are, we are moving towards much more porous uh, understandings. In, in yeah. interreligious yeah. situations, this is even more pronounced because, you know, people are marrying across religions. You know, Christians are marrying Muslims and Muslims are marrying Buddhists. And, you know, and, and suddenly you got to ask, okay, what kind of religion do the children belong to? Uh, are they Muslim Buddhists or Christian, Jewish Christians? Or <laughs> That bending of the boundaries, I think, is a very interesting phenomenon that is occurring in the next generation coming. You know, I, the, way I, the way I think about this is that, you know, human life is really, you know, we're, we're very fragile. We, we are vulnerable people and we know that we're mortal. And so we want to, one of the ways that we deal with that is by having an identity based, you know, um, on, a, on a way of seeing the world and in a group that, that believes that way of the, seeing that world, that world that way with us. And, uh, and it's very easy then for human beings, especially when we're isolated from one another, uh, you know, to, to then build our identity around an exclusivist, you know, ideology, and that we're the only the, the really true humans, and the other people really aren't really quite human. 
And, uh, and I, I know I grew up in a town of 300 people where there was only one person from Mexico, one person of color in my entire school. And it was very easy, especially in a community where we benefited so directly from the oppression of Native Americans. Mm -hmm. uh, to, to, to believe that, that you know, if, if other people would just become Christian, at least, at least they would kind of almost become human, even if they wouldn't be as important of, as us, you know. Right, right. And, and so what we have to begin to realize is that, that God is big enough, mm. or the divine is big enough, or the truth is big enough, or life is big enough to allow me to have an identity that also allows me to have a secondary identity and another identity that I can share with you. And I think it's, it's, it's something that, that we're going to have to keep working at learning, especially after 500 years of, of the doctrine of discovery, exactly. where, we have, where we have been told that what it means to really be a faithful Christian is to exclude and dehumanize other people. And, and, and that's how we, we maintain our status. You know, I, so let's, let's start talking about now the work of Omnia. So, so you all... Um, so, so help us understand what Omnia, Omnia Institute for Contextual Leadership does and how you begin to address this issue of in-group, out-group um, sort of separation and exclusivism. So what do you all do? Okay. Um, first, let me say that Omnia means all. It's a Latin word that means all. Uh, we were looking for a, a word that, that describes inclusivity, that, that all are included, and we came up rather brilliantly came upon Omnia. So, so this is this, we like this very much. The uh, Omnia is uh, 44 years old now. Previously, we were known as Scoop, Scoop, a Seminary Consortium for Urban Pastoral Education, an organization that started in Chicago as a consortium of seminaries that brought seminary, 12 seminaries, ecumenically oriented, we brought them to Chicago to put them out into the streets of the city so that they would learn to listen to the questions and the struggles of the people of the city and to build a theology from there. Mm -hmm. That's the contextual theology that we were working on. There were a variety of reasons when we reached uh, 40 in, 19, in 2016 that we decided that it was important for us to shift now and take this out to the rest of the world. Um, it, it had become quite successful in terms of the students who were going out to pastoral work in different cities and they were able to use this method in their communities. So we decided that we were going to take it out and uh, we asked the question, see I, I had come uh, to a school from the World Council of Churches and had participated in the kinds of dialogues with religious leaders. You know, the, the top religious leaders of the world would gather together. They would sit at a, at a nice hotel and have a lovely dinner and, and talk about deep and important thoughts and write a paper about that. And you know what? Nothing happened after that. Mm -hmm. That's what we call dialogue. Yeah. And, and of course, it was easy because, because, you know, Muslims and Jews and Christians and Hindus and Buddhists and all of these people who come to these tables are already inclined to, 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 to build relationships with each other. So there is no issue, you know. I mean, uh, we pat each other on the back and say good things about each other and it's fine. The problem is that there are people in our own communities who are very different, who will not accept that, Right. Who, who have the more exclusivistic theology or, um, or, or, or even extremists and therefore will use violence against each other who are, who are different from each other. Mm -hmm. So what Amiya said was that, um, you know, let's take this out to places where it really matters. Fortunately for us, we had an alumni from Nigeria uh, who's, who was now a church leader in Nigeria. And he was telling us about the struggles that they were having with Boko Haram, uh, which is one of the world's deadliest groups, uh, terrorist groups. And as we, as we heard those ter stories and, and the struggles that they're having, uh, and, and he said to us, you know, you all taught me how to 
how to go out into the city and understand the politics and the economics of the city uh, and how to deal with that. You didn't teach me how to do this thing with the with a group like Boko Haram. And I said, you know, nobody had written the book on that yet. <laughs> but because of him, he's a, he's a church leader, he's vice president of a very large denomination called Church of Christ of the Nations in Nigeria. Uh, as I said to him, I, uh, he said to me, why don't you come over and help us? And we agreed to do that. We found another uh, person in a different state in Northeast Nigeria called Gombe State, G-O-M-B-E, by the name of Abare Kala. Uh, if you all go to our website, you will, you will see stories and videos about, about these people. Uh, but Abare Kala invited us to Gombe State. Uh, Gombe State is right at the edges of where much of this violence takes place. And uh, Christians particularly are targeted by Boko Haram, but not only Christians, Muslims too, uh, get brutally murdered uh, and villages burned and ransacked uh, from time to time. Um, so uh, fortunately, Gombe is in the buffer zone between the rest of the country and the Northeast. Uh, so it's it's not nearly as violent as, as further east from there. But the antagonism between Muslims and Christians has been longstanding. And it is to that breach that Boko Haram has stepped in. Mm -hmm. And so we said... We want to bring Muslims and Christians together and give them a training and help them to build what we call interfaith peacemaker teams. And that they would learn how to collaborate with each other across religions. They would learn how to build power. They would learn how to think strategically and act strategically together. And so we now have 71 interfaith peacemaker teams in Northeastern Nigeria. Wow. And, uh, and they are doing some tremendous things, issues that come up from the ground, that, Im that are important to their community, issues that are urgent, relevant, and winnable. We, we've encouraged them to undertake only things that they can win because when they win a small victory, then they can go on to win a larger victory because you will build more power. And so since we did that, we've taken the program out to Sri Lanka uh, where uh, we have uh, varieties of violence going on. Uh, extremist Buddhists have been inciting violence against Muslims and Christians for a very long time. And then on Easter Sunday of last year, uh, we had uh, a, a bombings of three churches uh, by ISIS-related group. And uh, that was a tremendous tragedy, shook the whole country up. And even today, the Muslim community is struggling because of that, because of the repercussions of that. Subsequently, we've taken the program to Bangladesh. Um, many of the people in our uh, interfaith peacemaker teams there uh, are uh, in, in some of the worst slums I have ever seen uh, in, the, in Dhaka. Um, but there are 15 interfaith peacemaker teams in Bangladesh, 20 in Sri Lanka and 71 in Nigeria. Uh, so that's what we do. That is such an inspiring story. And you, know, you think about all of those contexts uh, in, which, in which you often have failed governments, you know, or governments that are actively oppressing minorities in one way or another, actively seeking to set one against another, um, right. you know, based on, 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 diff on, on differing I identities. And then you get you get as the as some of the scholars will say, you know, you start a cycle where, where the the democracy or the government's not working. People try to ask for something, and and the government, you know, uh, doesn't do it. Begins to oppress people. Uh, tries to scapegoat one group, pit them against each other, and certainly religious communities are are vulnerable in those moments to to uh, to being played essentially to begin to be pitted against each other. But what you all are doing is is showing that they have common ground and, and common values, and I've 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 been really impressed with you know with our previous conversations in which you you help me to recognize the the power of of acting together for the benefit of the community based on shared values and mutual relationships, and how powerful that can be to enhance the the peace of the entire community. Mm -hmm. 
And that's really what I really see you all doing out there. It's, it's really beautiful. Do you have any, any specific stories that you love to tell about, about some of those successes? Perhaps there's, uh, perhaps there's time for one. Now maybe, I don't know if there's time for two, I'll tell two. Yeah. Yeah. Um, one, of the, one of the stories I love to tell is about two women who came to our training in Nigeria. Uh, I think it was December of 2017. Mm -hmm. uh, they came from the same village, one a Christian, the other a Muslim. And they sat together, they did what we call a one-on-one -on -one conversation. This comes from community organizing language yes. that you might recognize. They yes. did a one-on-one -on -one conversation to, uh, to, to discover their shared interests. And then they, they, it was so good that, that they decided that when they go back, they are going to get other women to come together and pair up Muslims and Christians and build relationships. When I went back in the March of the following year, three months later, three or so months later, uh, they wanted to talk to me because there were 22 women, 11 pairs, Muslim and Christian pairs who had come together and built relationships. In October, when I went, there were 120. Wow. And they wanted to know what to do. Now we have this group of people, 60 pairs. What are we going to do? So we had a strategy session about what to do. This was uh, 2018, October. In February of 2019, there was going to be a general election. And general elections always, always uh, uh, have pre and post uh, election violence. And so the women said, what we ought to do is to try and stop the election violence. And so they decided to have a feast in January. They came together and had a community feast. They brought, they, they organized the place, brought some tables and so on, and everybody brought food and they ate and had a good time. And they invited my colleague Abare Kala to come and talk to them. And Abare challenged them to stop their husbands and their sons from committing violence. And they said, we are going to go on strike. If they go to violence, no food for you. And they stopped the violence. Wow. These women, 2,000 women who gathered together, uh, said to their husbands and sons, if you go to violence, you're not coming home. And, <laughs> and, and, that is so great. And, and, and because they were all together in this, they were able to do it. If it was a single person, they couldn't do it. If, if two or three or 10 people did it, they couldn't do it. But the, when the whole community joined together to do it, it was different. And that's sort of the best story that I have. Oh, that's a, that's such a lovely, lovely story. And, 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 you know, the thing that's, that's so, well, there's so many things that's so cool about that. And, and, and including like, we all know that when women are lifted up into leadership, that that completely changes an entire an entire community as well. Incredible things happen, really. I mean, I, I have no idea why. I can guess, but but incredible things happen. Let me just tell you one other thing about the, this period of COVID that we are in. Yeah. Um, Gombe State did not have so many at the early stages, so many cases at the early stages, so they did not go into curfew uh, uh, or lockdown like other places did. So there was a period of time when we were able to get our, uh, we call them IPTs, Interfaith Peacemaker Team leaders together so that they could go from village to village and tell the imams and the pastors to use their megaphones to tell the people how to do their hand washing for 20 wow. seconds, how to stand apart, six feet apart, with the social distancing, you know, all of those kinds of things. And we wrote a little manual to give to them. And we said, it's, you, you don't have to go do that. You need to get the leaders together, the imams and the pastors together. And they can use their pulpits to get this message out. And they got a whole group of nursing students together so that they could speak with some authority on these matters. And they went out to all of those villages and got the imams and the pastors together and told them, this is what you need to preach. And they did it. And wow. some of the traditional rulers said, 
you know, the government came and told us this is what you should do. They were nowhere near effective as the as as you guys coming and doing. The interesting thing is, it's Muslims and Christians together doing this. Yes, yes. That's what makes the makes a huge difference. You know, so that- yeah. So in the, in this country, I mean, I, you know, Shanta, I I think when you and I were in Chicago, uh, talking at at the coffee shop there, you know, we we know that 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 in in the United States. When we go to we go and engage with 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 uh, particularly a lot of Christian pastors uh, in this in this country and a lot of Christians, um, they they somehow think that 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 interreligious relationship, that multi faith you know peacemaking uh, is um, is somehow to set aside their faith right. And part of what we talked about that day is that is that in our context here. One of the things that we have to grapple with, again, as we've mentioned several times now, is Christian white supremacy. You know, whether it's in a soft form, like Christians are just the best, or whether it's in a hard form, like people that are different need to be hurt or go away. Um, so so how, how do you, like, use this, this term, like, receive theology? Like, what's your methodology about helping people to begin to, to understand that that Christian white supremacy that we grew up with that we didn't even realize was there. Like, how do you begin to help people grapple with that? Uh, one of our colleagues, we have a resource team, uh, Terry, that has 20 uh, really good leaders and scholars in there. Uh, one of them is Janine Hale Fletcher. She is a professor of theology at uh, Fordham University. Uh, not too long ago, maybe three years ago or so, she wrote a book called the sin of white supremacy. Uh, And she makes the theological case for why white supremacy has an antecedent in Christian supremacy. Yes. That that we have to dismantle Christian supremacy before we can dismantle white supremacy. She makes a very persuasive case for that, that I have begun to understand that that is true, that is correct. The, The... Whenever I make even the slightest suggestion that that is, that is the case, there's a thing called Christian supremacy. This is not, the, this is not a part of the Christian gospel. Uh, people get worried about that. People think we are, we, are, we are giving up on the gospel. No, it is not. Because the gospel is not about supremacy. It is, in fact, about, about humility. It is about taking the servant role that Jesus exemplified for us. It is about building power, but power that comes from below, not from above. And and to be used for for the sake of justice and not for the sake of domination or oppression. So to be able to understand that is very difficult. And and we're still struggling with that question, trying to figure out how best to get that message across. The other thing that you raised just now is, is that a lot of people think that it is when you relate with other people or people of other faiths, you are giving up or diluting your faith. I, I, I want to say for as one who has practiced interfaith dialogue and relationships for a whole lifetime, that's nothing further from the truth. In fact, your faith gets strengthened, solidified. Uh, 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 it, it, it's tested. And, and, and you come out more refined and, and more solid. So this, I think, is something that people uh, really does not understand. And it only comes if you engage with people who are of other religions that, that you begin to, uh, to, to, to understand this. You know, Shanta, the way I've been you know, working at this issue for a long time in my own, my own ministry, and, and it, is, it is truly difficult. Um, you know, first we, we need to remind remind our, our fellow Christians uh, as we're talking about Christian supremacy, is is that is that we're beloved enough of God that we can be wrong, yes, and we're beloved enough to change, and the change isn't against us; it's actually for us; it's for our benefit. So that's number one. Number two, the thing that I found with people is. When Jesus speaks about the kingdom of God or the reign of God in the, New, in the Christian scripture, um, well, what's the thing that, 
the, the, the reign of God is replacing. And that is the reign of domination mm. that was put in place by the Roman Empire. So the Roman Empire is an expression of this idea that what it means to be human is to have power over other people. And that what Jesus was offering was a, an alternative vision that, that, that was that, that we're going to live out the reign of God, which is the reign of mutuality. That yes. what it means to be human is to be in partnership with others. And, and so that's why it was so important when the disciples were fighting over who would be uh, number one, who would be Jesus' vice president when he entered into Jerusalem to become the president. Um, uh, and Jesus said, it shall not be so among you. Yes. That the, that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, use domination do, and dominate them. And then again, we, we, so we have so many instances in scripture where Jesus reframes power. And he, and he, 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 he talks about the reign of God being about, about how we work together, how we are partners and servants with each other, instead of trying to do a dog-eat-dog, -dog, winner-take-all kind of, of, of human society. And so I think a lot of times when people see that, the thing that the reign of God is replacing, they can begin to think, oh, man, that's the way some of our own society is working. Yes. And, but it takes a long time mm. for people. We have a lot of work ahead of us, Terry. Yes, we do. <laughs> we, need, we need more of us doing this work. Yes, we do. And, and I, I just want to say, Shanta, that one of my hopes uh, is that this is the first in a series of conversations and that eventually uh, Paths to Understanding could partner with uh, the Omni Institute for Contextual Leadership and do a training in the Pacific Northwest. Oh, I'd love to um, do that. And uh, because I, I really believe in many of, so here, what the situation here is that, you know, roughly, uh, you know, 80% of the population in Washington state doesn't do any kind of faith community. Mm -hmm. We're extremely, uh, we, we, people have moved away from, from, uh, from organized religion, as, as they would call it, although usually we're not that organized. Um, yes. and, and, and for some real reasons, I think because they in fact have sensed the, the supremacy, either the white supremacy or the Christian supremacy in us. But what I, what I see happening is we got f between 2 million people or so moving into Western Washington in the next 30 years. Hmm. So all of these small towns are going to have people from all over the world here. And we have to begin to create multi-faith partnerships and relationships so that we can recognize our neighbors. And we also have communities here which uh, have their own pains and their own problems. And how powerful it could be if we had some multi-faith peacemaking teams at work on the ground here, learning to listen uh, to the people most impacted by problems instead of imposing, having white people impose you know, their imaginary solution on others. And so when I first met you and heard about your work at the Parliament of the World's Religions, I said to myself, I've got to go meet that person. <laughs> well, I'm very glad that you did so. <laughs> so I, I, I hope that sometime, you know, when COVID is, is, is uh, getting a little bit more into, into some kind of resolution, but even before then, perhaps we can have some, some webinars together to help begin to build an audience uh, for some of that peacemaking. And I'd love to hear from some of the leaders you have around the world um, who can inspire us to see that, just because we're we're uh, we're not the majority in terms of people who are uh, who are of of active religious uh, community, that we still have a lot of a lot of power that we can have with each other to benefit our larger community. One of the things that we are planning to do is to have uh, not just some of our leaders, but some of our leaders who are at the grassroots. Um, to uh, to be able to speak to the kinds of questions that they are they are dealing with, I think that will be very illuminating for a lot of people. Well, Shanta, I, I so appreciate you know this time with you tonight, and uh, and uh, I just want to um, remind everybody that that uh, we're going to have a, a show next week uh, with some folks with uh, from the disability community to talk about the way COVID nineteen is really. Um, uh, helped reveal some of the, the biases against uh, people who happen to have disabilities, as my mom indeed had one. Um, so we're looking forward to that conversation next week. 
You can learn more about our work at pathtounderstanding.org. Um, you please encur encourage you to watch Challenge 2.0 hosted by Jeff Renner on our YouTube channel. Um, we are continuing our facts over fear campaign to counter anti-Muslim bigotry in the United States. And, and of course, we're, 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 we're setting some time aside right now, especially um, to, to lift up that we, we also believe Black Lives Matter. And we say that um, with great pride and, and with no apology. Um, and may, may all of us continue to, to pray for and to work for a resolution to the, 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 the institutional and structural racism that uh, our the people of color in this country experience. Uh, but as we all continue to do that, I, I say farewell with uh, be well, be calm, and be good to your neighbors. Uh, thank you, Shanta, very much. Thank you. Thank you, Terry. All the best to you. God bless. Thank Bye -bye. you. Have a good night. Thank you.